you would exist at one moment where your body is now. And at the next, well, next moment, some future moment, you would exist in the computer host. Um, now, there would either be a time when you did not exist, if your body was destroyed before the information was assembled in the computer host, or um, you know, maybe best case scenario, your body is destroyed the very instant that things are assembled in the computer and, and the, new, the new version of you starts existing. Joe, you and I have both had uh, a bit of an obsession with the concept of uh, virtual immortality. Uh, if you upload, uh, will you survive as a, as you, as an individual personality um, that is uh, more than a digital twin? Uh, if you have an identical a genetic twin born that way, um, the two individuals are completely separate. So if you had a digital twin instead of a genetic twin, would they be also independent? So you've uh, articulated the uh, the metaphysics of uploading. So give me some of the the parameters that you use and, and the assumptions you make and the uh, line of argument that you go from there. Yeah, yeah, so, so um, a lot of this work I've done with um, Susan Snyder, who I know is, a, uh, is someone that you, you speak with frequently. So yeah, I think there are a few different sort of dimensions along which you can classify different metaphysical theories of persistence. Uh, and then you can use those theories of persistence to draw conclusions about whether someone would survive uploading. And then once you narrow down which theory it looks like the, the better theory, you can look at what conclusions that theory licenses. Right. That's the area of personal identity and how you maintain personal identity over time, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also, I mean, personal identity is one aspect of this, but there's also, there are issues about identity conditions for ordinary objects, rocks, tables. Mm -hmm. And so we should have overall, you know, ultimately a general idea of, you know, what makes it the case that something continues to exist over time. Personal identity is just an especially interesting one with all sorts of other ethical and general philosophical issues associated with it. So, um, so one of the dimensions is um, sort of how you think of a substance. So do you think of a substance as on the analogy of a cushion with little pins in it? That's a common analogy. Do you think of it as having a, um, a sort of particular, um, something that is just the center upon which characteristics are sort of attached to it somehow? That's one view of substance. Another view of substance is what's sometimes called the bundle theory of substance. So um, this is sort of like a bunch of characteristics are tied together somehow, but the, the characteristics are not attached to some individual that's the bearer of those characteristics. The individual is just the group of things mm -hmm. somehow combined together. Um, then there are also issues about um, sort of what your theory of, uh, of time is and uh, what your theory of the, the um, continuation of, of time is. So there's, I mean, this can get quite detailed, but there are people who are typically called four-dimensionalists who believe that all times exist and um, the, the times can, can be um, sort of laid out. And what it is for an object to persist mm -hmm. over time is to have pieces, essentially, temporal parts um, spread out across time. So just like, you know, most regular material objects have spatial parts. Um, you know, I have a right side and a left side and a top and a bottom. Um, these things will have parts across time. Okay. Then there are also um, endurantists. Now these endurantists, many of them also believe that kind of time stretches out, but they believe what it is for an object to exist across time is for the very same thing to continue to exist from one time to another. So it's not like um, the, you know, it's not like if you were God looking out over, you would see eternity and see, um, you know, Joe or Robert spread out across time with different temporal parts across time, but you'd see literally the same object sweeping through time as opposed to being spread out with parts 
across time. Um, so those are there's some other distinctions that you can draw, and this this whole area of philosophy can get quite detailed. But that's at least a rough idea. So, so th those are the the categories that then you would use to assess the yeah. possibility of of, uh, of mind uploading. Yes. And so how so go through with me each of those yeah. and and what are the arguments for or against uh, mind uploading given those uh, yeah. given each parameter? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think probably the easiest um, case would be the case of three dimensionalism where an object must sweep across time in order to still exist and um, something where there's a. Um, a bare particular, and then characteristics are attached to that bare particular. So imagine, you know, this is again an analogy, but imagine a person is a pin cushion and all their characteristics, all their features are like pins stuck in the pin cushion. So, um, you know, and, and, and you can, people can have different views about what those characteristics are, but whatever they are, they're pins in the pin cushion. Okay. So let's suppose that you start off with your biological body and you get a, a brain scan and then the brain scan uh, transmits the information to a computer host and your body is destroyed. And now you're, you allegedly are in the computer host. And it's a perfect emulation. We, we won't, we won't uh, worry about the technology that has to be so incredibly beyond our, ca our current capabilities, but assume in principle it can be done. Yeah. Right, exactly. We're talking really, really futuristic here. Right. So in that case, your, you would exist at one moment where your body is now. And at the next, well, next moment, some future moment, you would exist in the computer host. Um, now, there would either be a time when you did not exist, if your body was destroyed before the information was assembled in the computer host, or, um, you know, maybe best case scenario, your body is destroyed the very instant that things are assembled in the computer and, and the, new, the new version of you starts existing. But either way, there's, there's probably a temporal gap, a gap in time. But at the very least, there's a spatial gap. And um, this is just not how the persistence of any ordinary sort of concrete object works. Mm. Um, you might be able to make certain kinds of cases for uh, subatomic particles and various like very fundamental physical weirdnesses. But for any sort of middle-sized concrete object or if, even if you believe that you know humans have souls or something like that, uh, a, a non sort of material but you know, sort of middle sized or at least uh, substantial sort of concrete object, we do not generally recognize these kinds of gaps. Um, we do not generally think that an object could continue to exist if it um, travels from one place to another without going through any intervening space. So I think that's those, those are the sort of um, best arguments for the standard case. Now, as you as you move away from that, so as you go to um, say a temporal parts view where people can have temporal parts, things get a little bit more complicated. You need to have a few more qualifications, but the same basic principles apply. Um, big, you know, uh, uh, discontinuities in space or time are not the sorts of things that. Um, that are generally thought to be compatible with a continued existence of the same the same object or the same thing. What makes it even more complicated in the first uh, discussion is uh, not when you destroy the body after you've emulated and, and transmitted all the information to a, a, a non-biological host medium, uh, but if you don't destroy the body, yes, yeah, and, uh, I mean that yes. that makes it even worse. Now you have two versions, <laughs> and if you can have two, you could have three. If you could have three, right. there's no limit to the number that you can have. And yeah. so, how do all these um, replications uh, articulate with each other and with the original, which we did not destroy? Right. Yes. Yes. No. I I agree completely. So um, I was sort of. So, so the cases where the body, the original body is destroyed, kind of um, a computer version of like a Star Trek um, beaming sort of scenario. Right. These are the best case scenario for 
um, the upload being yes. a survival of you. Right. Um, yes, as soon as you bring in these other situations, like, oh, the original body isn't destroyed. Um, you know, it, it's still there while the computer upload is there. Oh, and by the way, there are seven other computer uploads. Um, yeah, these are these are even worse for the idea that it's you in the computer. Now, I mean, it might be that um, people, when push comes to shove, don't care that much about um, their own survival. I mean, people like Derek Parfit, philosophers like Derek Parfit have made cases for these kinds of positions. Oh, what we really care about is um, the continued existence of memories of ours that have the right kind of causal connection to the original events. Whether they're still mine or somebody else's really doesn't matter that much, but we want to make sure they get into the future. It matters to me. Right, yeah. <laughs> I agree, yeah. Um, so you could go that, that route. But yeah, no, I mean, I think the reason why the personal identity stuff is worth thinking about is it does really matter to people. I mean, it does really matter whether it's you who continues or just something who, you know, is vaguely causally connected to you, but isn't you. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.